All right, party people, welcome back to the Negative BQ YouTube channel. This is your boy BQ. Kick out. Welcome to your Bound for Glory review for 2025. TNA put on a pretty good show with Bound for Glory last night. I'm recording this about 5.15 a.m. my time. I found this show to be a lot better than Slammiversary. I thought um, it's a little different because I was at Hard to Kill and Rebellion. And the experience in person is much, much different than watching on TV. Because when you're watching in person, you almost always... So it's really hard to gauge. But those two shows, the kick off the year, I thought were outstanding. I had a great time at both shows. Probably probably especially at Rebellion. And then um, Slammiversary rolled around. And, you know, it was kind of mirrored by technical difficulties the show you know there, there there was this great crowd but the production quality was awful uh for the majority of the show it was um very baby face heavy as far as just the baby faces winning all the matches which you know the first couple of pay-per-views had a lot of heel victory so i kind of get it but to me the baby faces maybe it makes a little more sense to get comeuppance around bound for glory then you can kind of reset storylines not to do it in the middle of the year at Slammiversary, but whatever. Um, that's only what I would do if I owned the company, which I clearly do not. But I thought Bound for Glory was a very, very good show. Production quality-wise, their best pay-per-view yet. It was crisp. It was clear. The lighting was great. You could see the people. It was very professional. And... um Almost brought a tear to my eye, folks, because, I mean, I have really struggled over the years covering this company. And there was about, you know, three, four years there where the, the show just looked so bad. And, and I, I was struggling. I was really struggling to watch it. I was struggling to cover it, struggling to enjoy it. And um, I'm, very, I'm very happy with how this looked. And I, I hope that going forward, they're going to continue to put this kind of effort into it. So. Really good show with Bound for Glory. Couple misses, um, but I can. That's for me personally. I can see where um, a lot of you very, very well may have liked it from top to bottom, as far as just enjoyed every show on the card. Uh, but there, of course, there was a couple that I I could have done without. When I did my preview show, I went over the betting odds and I pointed there was a pointed out there was a couple matches where you can make some money. And it was the Mike Santana and Moose, the knockouts uh, title match, Masha and Jordan, uh, Josh Alexander and Steve Macklin. There were there were some matches where you could um, put a really good parlay together and, and make some money. And I can't play here in Vegas. And I was I'm actually just pissed off that I didn't just ask my brother to put the plays in for me. Um, but whatever, I'll, I'll catch him on the next pay per view. So, um, so let's get into this. Let's get into this one time for your mind. This is again Bound for Glory 20. Did I say 2025 earlier? I feel like I I perhaps did. I don't know why. But it is 2024. Just in case I gave you the wrong year. I'm I'm already in 2025. I've been saying 25 all month for whatever reason. So just in my personal life, so that's why I was like I very well may have kicked the show off like that. Oh, man, but let's get into it. Let's get into it. So it kicked off with uh, the pre-show, which uh, featured Ash by Elegance. Come on, Teddy. Come on, Teddy. Heather by Elegance. He has an erection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> all her fault. And the personal concierge. That's my dad. But don't worry. He's cool. Really? <laughs> he doesn't look cool. And they took on the undisputed king of, not the king, but the undisputed queen of the rubber match. <laughs> Zaya Brookside and Brindley Reese from NXT. So um, I actually missed a little bit of this match. Uh, the reason for it was I was watching. Um, I was trying to watch on my TV downstairs and my uh, the remote, the batteries went out on the remote. And <laughs> for the longest time, I thought something was up with the TV and I'm sitting here and I cannot turn it on for the life of me. Then finally I dig up a couple AAA batteries, pop them in and boom, I was able to turn it on, but I did miss uh, a little bit of this match for that reason. Um, 
so this was this was okay. This was um these are your future knockouts tag team champions, Ash and Heather by Elegance. They they will probably win the titles by the end of the year because that's how the knockouts tag team division works. And I, I thought the match was fine. You know, they, they were able to get a couple NXT girls on the show here, which is which is cool. And Ash and Heather worked. And I thought the finish at the end with the uh I think I, I don't remember what she calls it she might call it reckless but uh, they, they got to change the name but the uh the spanish fly finisher that heather does followed by the rarefied air by ash you know i thought that was a nice little tandem finisher and the right team won here and you know it's the pre-show so it, it's okay to start the, the show off with something like this but i thought the the tag team match was fine and i think i think when these girls eventually win the titles and people can have their opinions on if they like Ash or not and the whole gimmick, but I think when they win the titles, they're going to make the titles very entertaining for a while, very similar to the uh, the influence when they had them at one point. You know, I, th- I think they're going to bring a lot to the uh, the titles. They're not going to have any challengers. That's always a, a challenge, but uh, trying to find <laughs> a couple of girls to put it, you know, to put a team together. Uh, but we'll see. Um, then we got the, uh, hall of fame and what they did for, uh, Bob Ryder, I thought was very good, very classy, uh, going over his contributions to the company over the years and giving us a couple, uh, we, I mean, we got abyss, we got AJ styles, you know, so they're recording from their phone, but that's fine. Whatever. Uh, we got Jeff Jerry, you know, um, we we had seven several people weigh in uh, with Bob Ryder, and he was inducted by Eric Young. I think those like those times where like the rah rah speeches and like getting everybody up, because like nobody really get motivated off that stuff anyway. But. And I thought his speech was very very good, very touching. I I had no clue they had that um, kind of connection. Maybe some of you guys did. I I didn't have a clue, and I didn't know that Bob Ryder didn't have immediate family, so. You know, God bless Eric Young and his family for uh, essentially kind of taking him in and, and building a relationship with him and, and including him as part of their part of their family. And then after that, they uh, inducted the convenience store machine Rhino, and he was conducted by Tommy Dreamer. I feel like the TNA Hall of Fame is done strictly to get Tommy Dreamer on the show and inducting somebody. And Tommy definitely needs a sound drop here pretty soon. I actually have a very good idea in my head of what that's going to be. Um, but Rhino came out, and I thought Rhino's speech was very good as well. I kind of give him a hard time just because I, I'm not someone who's a big fan of of bringing in older wrestlers, you know, especially when they come in and do garbage matches. So the ECW stuff is not my cup of tea, or at least not modern day ECW. You know, bringing in dudes in their fifties having garbage matches, you know, so I I tend to get kind of turned off when I see the dreamers and the rhinos and all all that show up on TV. But, um, he's, he's really rhino has a very, um, underrated contribution to this company as far as, uh, as winning the world title winning. It was weird that Tommy dreamer called him a two time call your shot gauntlet winner. I thought he was forecasting that rhino was going to, I was like, shit, rhino's going to win this thing again. So <laughs> that one that one scared me for a little bit. Um, but he has, you know, his contributions over the years, they go under the radar because Mike was pulling the, uh, pointed this out on his Patreon that they, they tie Rhino to ECW. He, he's he's kind of, he's more of a TNA guy, really. You know, and then and then there's people who obviously connect him to the WWE days. But it's like his real runs were in TNA. That was his real contributions to the wrestling world. And I thought it was very touching when he get, when he gave a shout out to Heath Slater, because I I think Heath, you know, aside from the story he told, um, Heath kind of helped resurrect his career a little bit. They they were a throwaway tag team in WWE, and they they were able to make magic together. They tried to rehash that in TNA. It, I, I didn't think it totally worked, but you know, congratulations to the convenience store machine Rhino. 
And this this was I, I thought this I just I thought the speeches were good. This was probably the best induction I think, and uh, and or not induction, but best Hall of Fame ceremony over the years. <clears throat> and I I prefer getting a couple shorter speeches rather than one long speech. And the great thing about the partnership with the WWE is now that they've done this, they can start to induct some individuals who are over there. You know, so maybe ultimately it's AJ Styles one day, which he said, I believe he said he would be open to doing it. Um, and especially since he's doing video, not video packages, I don't even know what to call them, but, you know, we've seen him on screen a couple times over the years um, with, with the Hall of Fame ceremony. So having this this partnership is going to really, really help the Hall of Fame to where maybe next year they could, they can even do three inductees because it was one of those things over the year where over the years where you're kind of struggling to find that one person, you know? And um, now you you can do two. They're starting to do two. You know, I guess last year technically three, but they're starting to do a couple inductions. And, you know, they can probably, they can probably kick that up a little bit now. Because there's some people in AEW who wrestled in TNA, and Tony's not going to let them do it. I can, I can promise you. And... Like Christian Cage is not going to happen. I, I can tell you that right now. I just just from stuff I I know talking to people within a company, I, I can tell you that's probably never going to happen. Um, but there are there are a few people over there who could be inducted probably eventually. But I don't know that Tony would let him. So um, that's enough about the Hall of Fame. I'm going off on that a little bit too much. Now after that we had the Call Your Shot Gauntlet. I'm not going to go over every single name. And I'm certainly not going to play every single soundbite. We'll be here all day. I'm not going to go over every single name. When I was previewing a show, when I was doing my podcast reviewing Impact, I told you guys, every Call Your Shot gauntlet has one storyline go- going into it. And that storyline is what plays out. It is the most predictable match that they do. The only unpredictable one was when Bully Ray won. And people were really upset about that. Now, he ended up doing some good business with Josh after that. But initially, when people were like, hey, Steve Macklin needs to win this, Bully Ray wins, you know, people were upset about that. But this, man, this match, you know, it was the same when they had the the gauntlet for gold. I think that's what they called it, or I, I don't remember, several years ago. This match really, I'm not saying it's the Royal Rumble. But it can be their Royal Rumble. It can be their money in the bank. It can be so much more than it is. It can be so much more than, hey, we announced the match the week before the pay-per-view, and it's going to be on the pre-show. Now, I understand why it was on the pre-show, because it was supposed to, it's the free match. Frankie wins, and um, that's a storyline that's supposed to carry it through one of the main events. So I do get it. But they can make this mean more. And they they pitch it to us like you never know who's gonna show up, right? Um and their surprises were Rhino, uh Rohit Raju, which I was happy for Rohit. I've explained to you guys before that he was one of my favorite wrestlers in the company, able to build a little bit of a friendship with him over the years. I haven't talked to him in a little bit, but I, I check in with him every once in a while. And when they announced that they were going to be in Detroit, you know, I kind of made the joke, oh, Rohit and Allison K job matches incoming. <laughs> and those are two, probably the two wrestlers I have the best relationship with. Um, so I, I hope that they're they're both on the show. Rohit, I, I could very well see him doing this set of tapings here. And I hope they, man, I hope they keep him around. Like this was, that was one of their biggest balls dropped, in my opinion, ever, as far as someone who really could have got to the main event scene, but they just would not pull that trigger. It, I mean, they almost wouldn't let him out of the X division, like get him to the X division championship. They just would not pull the trigger to get him to that point. You know, I, I would love to see him back. Um, I thought Kylan King might show up. I thought a steel was going to show up. I thought the, that hockey player dude, that old guy, I'm not familiar with him. I thought he was going to show up. So they didn't really do, Comedy spots. I um I didn't write all the participants down. I don't know that they didn't. Uh, there might have been a third surprise. I think there was only two this year, but definitely 
kind of a, you know, kind of a, I mean, I don't really care. I'm not really a surprise guy, but it was kind of a letdown for those people who are looking for surprises because there's the TNA fantasy bookers online. It's going to be Donovan Dijak. It's going to be Trevor Lee. You know, people are coming out with all these things. But once they announced it on the pre-show, I, I really doubted anyone big was going to show up. But anyway, as I said, this is the pr most predictable thing that they do. It has one storyline every year. And everybody knew Frankie Kazarian was going to win this thing. Let's give Frankie a sound drop. It's a block party. I'm not playing with y'all, bro. He came in at number one. This was the six ever Call Your Shot gauntlet. Three of them have been won by the person who drew number one. So we got Eddie Edwards, Rhino, and Frankie Kazarian. And it's kind of like when I watch the Royal Rumble. I don't watch WWE on a really regular basis, but... I, I usually try to catch the Royal Rumble, if, if anything. And I feel like every time I watch it, someone who draws number one wins or the or number one and two are there at the end. I mean, it seems like it, it, we're getting to that like every single year. This past year, I think number one won. Like, I think the women's match or something. So um, th this, this gimmick, they're going to kill it. If everyone's winning from the first spot, who cares? Because one of the gimmicks in this match is that they have a six pack challenge and the winner draws number 20, but no one ever wins from 20. No one even, not, not even close to 20. Everyone's winning who comes in at the beginning of the match. So the, I mean, they, they have to kill that for the next several years. They got, they got to stop having the person who comes in at the beginning win. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I don't think they needed to have Frankie come in at number one. There was no reason for him to lose the other day. They could have just, you know, they could have had Sammy Callahan come in number one and AJ Francis come in at number 20 and still get your desired result. Frankie could just come in at five or six and win, win the damn match. So, but I was entertained with it. It was, it was good enough. I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not, not, not poo pooing on the match by any means. It's just that we're sitting here through a, a 20 minute match where we know what the outcome is going to be. And it's, it's a little much. And they just, they need to kill this someone coming in at number one and winning. It's it's getting very old now. And then to kick off the show, unfortunately, I did miss probably the first five or six minutes of this, but it's the X Division Championship match. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. Featuring the X Division Champion Cheeseball Mike Bailey. Cheese. Yeah. Didn't we lock you in the dumpster one time? I got out. And he took on El Hijo de, del Vikingo, who I guess is going to be around for the set of tapings. I think he's NXT bound. But he's going to be around for the set of tapings. And uh, the fans always enjoy him. He always puts on a show. Am I a, f a fan of jumping and flipping around and all that? I'm not. But this was an excellent way to kick off the show. And even though I thought it was going to be a, you know, a bunch of grab ass. They did some, they had some spots here that, you know, were, were pretty good. I, uh, when, when, when Vikingo stood on the, on the pole and Mike Bailey was on the ring apron and he jumped off and hit a Canadian destroyer. Like that was one of the most impressive things I ever seen. I'm not a big fan of 50 Canadian destroyers in a match. Thank you. AEW for that. But this was a, a really awesome spot. It was a very fun match. And for those who are really into these kind of matches, I think they probably love this. And it definitely got the crowd going. I'm not a Cheeseball Mike Bailey fan, but I don't think he has a... He doesn't have anything remotely close to a bad match. I just don't like his character. I don't like his promos. You know, that's the only reason I don't like him. Um, well, I don't like him as strong. I'm just not like a fan fan of his i'll support anyone in tna but he doesn't have bad matches and and they're not they're not flippy doodah like there is a little bit of that but there's they're selling as well and there's there is a bit of a story being told like he's not doing moves just to do moves like you see in AEW. so i don't know what his future is going to be with the company i know there's some, some people think that he's on his way out I just think TNA is a perfect place for him. I cannot see him 
succeeding in any of the, uh, these other companies because he's so far behind the ball when it comes to cutting a promo. I mean, he's way behind it. Like, not I'm not saying heard he did in Japan. It was while he was with TNA, but um, he uh, he cut one in Japan that was excellent. I'm like, why don't we get that on on TV here? You know. So that's the one thing that's really holding him back. But he doesn't have a bad match. Like you, you know that you can just put him in, and he's going to get the crowd excited. Now, um, the match we got after this was the Knockouts Tag Team Title Match, which was really, really tough for these girls to follow up what we just saw. But we had Rosemary and Wendy Chu, and they were def- or they were challenging against the reigning, defending Knockouts Tag Team Champions, Spitfire. Tell me right now that I'm just a job. Tell me to my face. You're just that- a job. Um, this was, this was probably, this was probably the worst match on the show. It wasn't my worst match on the show, but if we're just going to say freaking Dave Meltzer jerk off star ratings, okay, we're just putting star ratings on everything. This was probably the worst match of the show. I don't know why they were making such an, uh, an effort, such a point in the beginning to say, oh, she was away for personal problems. She's back. Spitfire as a tag team has not been on TV for like over a month. Jody Threat wrestled this past episode, but other than that, they've been completely gone. Like they frankly didn't have to say anything. It, no one would have like realized either way. All the way up to this match, the I, I kept saying, I think Rosemary and Wendy Chu are gonna challenge and they're gonna win the belts. But then as we got closer and closer, up until the day of, when I was doing my betting odds. I said, no, Spitfire is going to win this match. And there was a couple of reasons. There was absolutely no story to build up to it. I know, I know Telegraph and Tom keeps telling us that, um, you know, he's basically saying at some point someone from NXT is going to win a TNA title. But even though I thought this was the spot for that initially, I really changed my mind because future tag team champions, Heather and Ash by Elegance, are obviously going to feud with these girls and then they're going to win the titles and then probably. split spitfire up for all i know but it just didn't make sense for rosemary and wendy chu to win and then go on a feud with the only other tag team that's left so i really changed my mind on that one after i really thought about it and again i I didn't think this was like particularly good but it wasn't it wasn't bad it wasn't something that you know the crowd fell asleep through it was it was just okay it was very difficult to follow up that x division title match um, and Spitfire ultimately gets the win, and then Rosemary spears Wendy Chu after the match, which is weird because at one point Rosemary hit a, a spear, and then I don't remember if it was on um, Jody Thread or Danny Luna, but you know you get a two count, and then she pulls her up by the hair. And every time a heel does that, it means the heel's going to lose the match. That is a one hundred percent. So I knew at that point, okay, Spitfire's definitely winning. But what's weird is Rosemary technically cost them the title there. And then Wendy Chu is the one who gets speared at the end because she was the one pinned. This probably means we're going to get Rosemary versus Wendy Chu. They didn't announce it for Impact, but I I think we're probably going to get it and they were going to split it up. One of the reasons, too, that I said I I didn't think that Rosemary and Wendy Chu were necessarily going to win is because logistically we're talking about one person in one company, one person in another you're now committing to Wendy Chu having to show up at Impact every month or uh, Rosemary have the, having to show up at NXT every week or every other week. You know what I mean? So just the logistics to me as an outsider didn't make a whole lot of sense. So they probably had to do this to split them up. But even though they were a great tag team, they were very awesome, a great act. But Rosemary has reinvented herself a little bit in a good way because the 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 first rosemary we got years ago in 2014 2015 whatever it was excellent and then she started getting more popular and it was still working and then it started turning into comedy and then she got into a heel tag team with Taya Valkyrie which was really good and it got started getting rosemary back over as a heel because there was no fans at the time that were going to be cheering for her. and then uh, and then uh, Ty Valkyrie left the company, and then Rosemary starts becoming a you know a member of Decay again, which people got excited about, but it didn't work. 
and they've just really been going back and forth. And and she's a she is a lifer for this company. She's a future Hall of Famer for this company. And the company benefits when she is when she has a good character and she has a good story and she's a big part of the show. So we'll see how that how how the time in NXT and how the time with Wendy Chu help her develop her. her um, and and maybe she gets into the knockouts title picture. Maybe as a challenger, you know, I, I don't know that she's for whatever reason they don't put the title on her, but you know, we'll we'll see what they do. After this, we got Gia Miller. Jesus Christ, that's perfect. Of course you're here right now. And she was sneaking up on Frankie Gazarian, who was halfway through the Earl Hebner book. He probably should have been closer to the end if he was learning how to be a referee. So they they have a storyline that's, you know, it started on the pre-show. Frankie Gazarian wins. And now they're getting him on screen to remind us that he is the winner of that match and that he's going to be the uh, guest referee later in the evening by the way that knockouts tag team match went entirely too long that's the other comment i meant to make about that following this was the match that i thought was far and away the best match on this show jonathan not jonathan josh alexander i don't want to play with you anymore versus steve mackle So the Northern Armory was probably supposed to get involved in this match. They said due to travel issues, they couldn't be there, which, you know, so Telegraph and Tom let us know beforehand because I think everyone expected them to to interfere because Eric Young was said at the top of his show that he got, got his back if the Northern Armory showed up. And it sounds like they probably really did have travel issues <laughs> because I 100% believe they would have been involved in this match one way or another. This match right here, this is my favorite match of the year. It's my favorite. So as a podcaster, as a fan, when as someone who just reviews the show, someone who watches the show and annoys it, I mean, annoys it, it, it annoys me, uh, someone who analyzes it, reviews it. I'm, I'm always telling you guys, I said at one point here, I'm not a big fan of the X Division style of wrestling. I like wrestling. I don't like smaller wrestlers. And, and, to be clear, that doesn't mean I don't like smaller people. I'm not a, a short shamer. I actually think short shaming is um, is unacceptable and unac- unacceptable, unacceptable, and something that is still prevalent in society. When you're not allowed to body shame, you're not allowed to fat shame, you're not allowed allowed to call someone ugly, but you can make fun of someone for being short, and I don't think that's okay. So, just to be clear, I, I'll get off my high horse there. Just to be clear, I'm not short shaming anyone. But when I'm I'm watching pro wrestling, I don't like watching small wrestlers. Just like if I'm watching gymnastics, I don't want to see someone six foot tall try to do it. There's just a time and a place for everyone. <laughs> and for me as a fan, I'm not a big a big fan of the smaller wrestlers, duck dip, dive and dodge. Okay, guys who've got a little bit of size to them, they're five eleven, six foot, six one, six two, have have some physique. I'm just old school. Like that's what I like to see in, in wrestling. I knew that I was going to like this match. This was one of two matches that had any kind of heat going into it. This was another one. If you were betting, there was some money to be made because the favorite in the betting odds was Steve Macklin. And I was like, man, I think Josh Alexander's winning this thing. The only reason I was kind of on, kind of on the fence was because I don't know how long Josh Alexander is going to be around. Much like I said for Cheeseball Mike Bailey, this is the place for him. I think he needs to stay here. I think it would be a big mistake, maybe not financially, but for his wrestling career, I'd be, I think it would be a very mis- big mistake for him to go anywhere else. There's some people who do better as a big fish in a small pond because it takes genuine star power to really make it in WWE or you know, even to make it to the top in AEW, even though very few people have star power there. But it's still a big company with a big roster. You have to be far and away better and stand out than everybody else. Now, Josh is an excellent wrestler. Obviously, we know that. I just don't think he, personality wise, even as a heel, which he's a great heel, I don't think he would stand out to the point, not with the amateur wrestling look, to the 
to reach superstardom. So I think this is the company for him. I think the Northern Armory has a lot of legs and they need to continue to develop that. And this match here, I just thought it was the best match on the card. The the way they were working, um, just at the end when, when they put, when he put the zip ties, and I told you guys when I was previewing the show, I was like, the zip ties are going to play into the match because they've been, They've been doing that, and I and I also said I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't have a match where they're both zip tied and had to wrestle. They could probably pull it off these two. And I said that jokingly, but after this match, I'm like that might be a, poss- a real possibility. But when he zip tied him and would not allow Goofy Daniel Spencer to to cut it off, and he continued to wrestle, I thought he really got over, continued to get over as a babyface, get over as a badass. And then at the end, he ends up in the ankle lock and he can't do anything because he can't freaking move. He can't, he can't crawl. And then Josh gets a much needed win. The loss elevates. We repeat, repeat that. It elevates Steve Macklin. This was the best thing on the show, in my opinion, far and away. I was in love with this. I was, I was, I was almost shedding tears. I thought this was so good. So. I'm I'm I was excited about the match going into it. It was the only match I was excited about going into this thing. Like I'm I'm you know, TNA's got a pay-per-view. I'm like, okay, cool. I can't wait to watch it. But as far as yo, I really want to see this, like this was it. And this was this was money, this was magic. This I'm I'm very excited actually to see how this uh Dave Meltzer's not going to give this five stars. He's going to give it three and a half. This was fucking five star shit right here. After that, we fell off a cliff. And in my opinion, I saw people online liked this. I did not. This was Monsters Ball. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell you. Right, let me tell you. <laughs> we don't care. Featuring Matt Cardona challenging for the digital media championship and whatever other whatever other title PCO is carrying around. That's right, baby, PCO. Like so this was Monsters Ball. I, I tell you guys all the time, I don't like these matches. I don't like hardcore gar- garbage matches, and they're just pulling stuff out just to do it. I don't think I can ever enjoy one of these matches. It's just not, it's just not in me. I I would have been a little bit better if with it if Matt Cardona won because he can do something with those titles. PCO is doing nothing with those belts. I don't know what it is that they keep putting these digital media titles on people who either don't have digital media or don't I mean a uh, social media or don't use it as a normal person because he's a character so he's not going to get on I, I don't know. I I need to stop even connecting this title to digital media or social media in any way, because that's not what it is. It's a prop joke title that they should have got rid of and made a television title at the top of the year. He's doing nothing for it. It means absolutely nothing. So every time we get one of these feuds for the digital media championship, people are cheering for the person that they think can do something with the belt. So people wanted Matt Cardona to win this thing. And Matt Cardona, I think, I mean, of all these people, these former WWE guys that they come in and put titles on, like this is the this is the dude, man. That you know, it, he he started um, creating a really badass character on the indies, and TNA just never tapped into it. They just wanted him to be Zack Ryder, basically, with a little more edge to him, no pun intended. And he, you know, he he doesn't want to sign there long term. He keeps saying, "I don't want to sign. I'm, I want to be a free agent." He just wants to wrestle for one of the bigger companies. That's all it is. So, what I was saying is, he's basically using TNA um, for dates and to get on TV. But still, with that being said, even though this dude is openly campaigning to go to another company, I I did want him to win here. You know, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, "Yo, th- this company loves their feel good moments for PCO." And, you know, he wins the match and Tom, I, I, no, I, okay, I'm going to say putting the thumbtacks into his cheek and all that, I thought was pretty cool. I was actually very impressed with PCO and uh, have a lot of respect for him for doing that. Um, but he wins the match and Tom Hannafin's like, he finally gets his revenge. 
this motherfucker has gotten his revenge on every episode of Impact since the wedding. It, like Cardona took him out at the wedding, jumped him at the honeymoon. PCO's been whooping this guy's ass ever since on every episode. And that's why I kept saying, where's where's the heat going into this? Where's, you know, Cardona's not running from this guy. He's, he's PCO whoops his ass every week. Now, I thought when I was making my predictions, I was like, I think his monsters are going to show up. Shira and, and Madman Fulton and Khan. I thought all these dudes were were showing up. This wasn't as overbooked as I thought it was going to be. They just had a hardcore match. And for people who like that, the match was fine. Speaking of those three guys, usually with the Call Your Shot gauntlet, they split up the tag teams. And I guess just to get someone their booking fee, they'll, you know, like the Rascals will come out together, but only one will be in the match. That's kind of how they have done it over the years. But this ma- this match actually had Hammerstone and Jake and the Rascals and and First Class. You know what I mean? I was actually surprised by that because they had single guys who they use as enhancement towns, so to speak, like the Shearers and the Jack Prices and the um, Jackson Stones and all those, all these guys that they – could have brought in and they just never used that match in that way. Um, speaking of the call your shot gauntlet, they dumped Laredo kid like a piece of trash in that match. And I'm sitting here. I'm like, what if Laredo kid wins the match? Like what's he's going to be the first dude to call a shot for the digital media championship. But yeah, PCO versus Matt Cardona um, just was not for me. Really. I just wanted this match to be over so badly. Like I'm sitting there on my sofa just like uh, please please make this end and then finally it did after that we got mike santana that's nasty and he took on moose and this was one of the other matches that had a little bit of heat to it now the only difference between this between jo- with, with this with josh alexander and macklin is josh and macklin has had nothing but heat like josh is whooping these guys he's been whooping Mac- macklin's ass every single week as the heel uh, Macklin will also ultimately get his comeuppance, but here Santana, it's been like kind of 50, 50. There is some heat, but I mean, he also went into their locker room single handedly and beat them all up by himself and wrote them off TV for a week. So it didn't really have the level of heat to me that Josh Alexander and Steve Macklin did, but it did have some heat. And this was another match where there was some money to be made with the betting odds because the betting odds favored moose. And if you put m- money on Mike Santana, uh, you would have you would have you would have won a little bit of money. And again, I'm very mad at myself for not just having someone. I should have just Venmoed someone some money and made these plays for me, made these picks. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. Um, but that being said, I thought they put on a a, a very very good match as well. The only I I don't want to say the only issue I had with it because. If it played out the way I said, then Moose would have won the match. And that was at one point where Moose kind of hit a surprise spear on him. I thought that should have been the finish. And when when Mike Santana kicked out, I was like, oh, this match is not going to end. But I would have been okay with Moose winning because it would have just extended the feud out a little bit because Moose is the former world champion, you know, like. He shouldn't just go to a regular pay-per-view. I mean, yeah, go to a pay-per-view, wrestle a regular match, and lose. I think he is, um, you know, I I think he's just too big of a star for that. I would have been okay with them pushing this off a little bit further to, you know, to Genesis, which they announced that Genesis is coming back. Um, That's going to replace Hard to Kill. Hard to Kill was a Scott Demore thing, so that makes a lot of sense to me. And... I'll I'll finish talking about Genesis here in a sec, but Josh Alexander, I mean, Josh Alexander, Santana wins the match. He's in line for a, a major push. You know, we already know that we we've known. I, I think that his spot bound for glory. I think it was always his spot. I think he was supposed to wrestle for the world title, but they had to pivot with everything going on with Joe Hendry. But, um, but they had, they had a good match here. I just thought, the one spot where Moose kind of hit the surprise spear on him, like should have been the finish. So if you're going to have Santana win, like just don't do that spot because that, that was unnecessary. But to go back to what I was saying about Genesis, 
I had been thinking this in the back of my mind that TNA really needs to freshen up their pay-per-views. Because every year we know it's hard to kill. We know it's rebellion. We know it's slam adversity and bound for glory. But it's like we need something fresh here, especially if they're like rebranding to TNA. You know, like let's let's freshen up. And I think getting rid of hard to kill for Genesis is a great idea. I think rebellion also needs to be needs to go away. I think they need to come up with something else for that because they're not going to replace Slam Reversi and Bound for Glory. So that's what I think needs to happen. I would love for them to have a fifth pay per view, but you know they do the TNA shows every month, the TNA Plus shows, and those are mini pay per views basically. So it's really not that big of a deal. So a uh, great match here. And then after that, we had another very, very good match. Jordan Grace, the Knockouts champion, defending against Masha Slamovich. Meet Fran Stalinaskovich Delvedevinsky. And these two have been, they've had amazing matches. This was another match where there was some money to be made because Jordan Grace was the favorite. Like, you really could have put a parlay together of Masha Slamovich, um, Mike Santana, Steve Macklin. Uh, I forgot what the other one was. There, there was there was four you could have put a, a really strong parlay together and made some like real money because Vegas odds were just they were they were not did not have their finger on the pulse of this show. Masha Slamovich had a great look to her when they were showing some of the previous clips of them wrestling when she kind of just had this like Frankenstein look. I just never thought she looked like a star. I was like, she's good. Like she's a better wrestler than Jordan Grace, in my opinion, but she never looked like a star. She looked like a star at Bound for Glory. And I I no oh, let me get let me shout out Tom Hannafin real quick as I as I always do every episode. I've got I've got something to say about this dude. Um he would not fucking stop. Every five minutes of this pay-per-view, bound for glory. I'm just like, oh my fucking God, dude. Like he was doing it on TV as well, like just nonstop. When they when they had the main event on the show this past week, he just kept saying, "Full metal mayhem at Bound for Glory." Like he did it like six times in the match. I was like, "Jesus Christ!" I know you're trying to sell a sh- show, but good lord! But even during the pay per view, just nonstop Bound. I'm like, "Oh Lord!" So I, I'm I'm glad his show was over. Jesus Christ! But you know, to getting back to this, um, they th- this knockouts match. It would be tough to find a better a better match than this in, in 2024, 2023, oh. 2022. I mean, you can you can go back. It would be very difficult to find to find something that was better than this because they have the chemistry that Masha Slamovich and Jordan Grace have is is second and none. Now, I want to go back and say that I was really critical about them making Masha Slamovich a heel. And I said, hey, Jordan Grace hasn't had a single storyline this whole year. And now they're trying to create this storyline when they really could have just got away with just having a match, a babyface versus babyface match and doing a passing of the torch moment. You know what I mean? And so I, I was very I was very upset about it. But I also, also kind of prefaced my um, my rant with saying we don't know what they're going to do about for glory. We don't know what the plan is. We're just dealing with the information we have in front of us where they looked like they were building this huge baby face and then they started pulling back and it looked like they were going with what works and and her her being a heel. You know, so I said there's also a possibility that the match happens and it's hugs and handshakes after the match, which is what it was. Uh, Masha Slamovich ultimately wins this match um, and and I do think she is going to remain a baby face or or go back to it. You know, it looks like they just wanted to add a little bit of heat to the match and, and going back, Looking at it, no harm, no foul. You know, I think I I really went over the top with it, and I was very upset about it. Uh, I, I cared more than I probably should have, and I really destroyed him for it, to be honest with you. I, I was just like, you had a, an incredible well, – we had a big baby face organically built, and then you, you pull back on it, you know. But it was actually – I think it was actually pretty masterful, uh, the way they did it, and – if she's going forward and this was a passing of the torch oh, moment, then great, wonderful. You know, she's she's what the knockouts division needs. The issue that they had coming into 2024 was that 
they didn't do anything to prepare for. You know, they brought in Ash and they brought in Zaya Brookside, but they did they really did nothing to prepare for departures of Diana Perrazzo, of Mickey James, of Trinity. It, there was just not a contingency plan. That's just how it how it came off. And then it hurt because Kylan King got hurt and she was someone that I thought might have been in this spot. I think she's really good. And I know she's gonna be back very soon, but you know, they took a lot of L's in this knockouts division this year, and they they were treading water like I've never seen them tread water, and they they got there. They I mean, they only had two knockouts in the Collier Shot Gauntlet this year. It was uh Zy- freaking Bill Goldberg and um uh Jane I just don't remember her name, and then um uh Tasha Steeles. So I mean that just shows you like there's just no depth the the, sh- the division is so shallow right now. So um Masha they, they're going they're they're not going to make that mistake when Jordan leaves. Like Masha's going to take that spot. And she's she's a much better wrestler, not to say much, but she's a better wrestler than Jordan Grace. So she doesn't have Jordan Grace's look necessarily, but she can kind of she can have that title forever. They they can keep it on her for a very long time. Now, I hope they find some better storylines. And I'm a fighting champion. Uh, I'm going to do open challenges. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm going to give Matt Raywall a shout out for the end of this match. Hey, man, I really appreciate that Patrick Price on my insurance, Jay, from State Farm. Because at the very end, she hit the snow plow from the top, you know, from the turnbuckle, from the top rope, second rope, whatever you want to call it which was good storytelling because their first match, Jordan Grace had to hit a, a Grace driver from the top. So now in this one, Masha had to hit the snowplow from the top. I thought that was excellent long-term storytelling right there. And then Tom Hannafin called this as a um, superplex. You know, she, she hit the move off the top oh. rope and, you know, he's called it a suplex and Matt Raywall was able to insert himself real quick, kind of save the moment and said it was a snowplow. And then she picks her up, hits a pile driver, and wins the match. I think that pile driver should be her finish. I think the snow plow is a trash finisher. I think it has a trash name. Uh, it's, I mean, Al Snow named it. It just, it just makes no sense. So uh, I, I kind of like the finisher, the, the pile driver better, even though we have two people who do pile drivers on the show already. But I, I did, I do like that better than the snow plow. But this, this another along with. Macklin versus Josh Alexander, like five star shit. I'm not trying, but incredible match. Those those were the two show stealers, in my opinion. And then backstage, we're getting ready for this is a triple main event, and I kind of I was I was like, why is there three main events? That makes no sense. And it's because with this match, they made a questionable finish, and they obviously cannot end the show with it. So. Uh, backstage, we have Joe Hendry, um, and he's with Ace, Ace Steel. My security, my safety, my life was in danger. And he is uh, getting him ready to go. And I thought it was a really nice touch showing him in Gorilla before they, they came out. With Nick Nemeth, when he came out, I would have liked if the, the camera panned to the back of him and you saw the entire crowd in front of him. I thought that would have been a much nicer touch. But after this, um, you know, after that excellent match, we had uh, the world title, so it's Joe Hendry. Believe that taking on the TNA World Champion Nick Nemeth. I've been talking to people walking here. We've been talking about next year, and I'm sitting there saying, "I'm not gonna be here." <laughs> and I made some predictions. You know, this was a, a very difficult match to predict. We knew it was going to be overbooked. I said there's going to be at least four people involved in this. A freaking one-on-one match and it was five because they brought ryan nemeth out who looked like a fool but i guess that was just kind of part of the story of the match they made a questionable decision here and i i picked joe hendry to win this match even though in the back of my mind i thought nick nemeth was gonna win i explained to you guys and i'm, I'm explaining this to you as a fact not bq's opinion okay tna does not think Joe Hendry needs the title. Doesn't mean they're not eventually going to put it on him. But he is over. He's big time over. They don't feel he needs the belt. 
So for that reason, I was like, I don't think he's going to win. I also had, you know, I also said that Joe Hendry, when he does win, because I think he will eventually, it would be foolish not to put the belt on him. I think it makes more sense for him to beat a heel. And then also Nick Nemeth, I don't think he's going to lose in this company. He might lose once. But I, I, I don't know if he wants to lose to someone from TNA. Like, I honest to God think that. I can really see a scenario where he just loses because um, Frankie Zarin cashes it on him in a way that he doesn't look weak for actually just losing a match normal, like losing it clean. Or they're going to have some triple threat where Frankie uh, or where Joe Hendry pins Frankie Zarin. Like, I just, I really see a scenario where, where Nick Nemeth does not get, does not lose. If he does lose, it will be once. It won't be twice like Trinity where she loses her rematch. Like it'll be once and then he'll be done. So I just didn't see him wanting to lose here. I didn't see babyface versus babyface and then Joe Hendry winning. There was no real heat to the match. You know, I had my kids come downstairs. They didn't want to watch the whole show with me, but um they wanted to watch this. They're they like Joe Hendry. And we were, you know, as a family, we were pretty disappointed when he got pinned at the end. Now, I've said Joe Hendry's a mid-carder. He's a popular mid-carder that you can use in the main event, but to me, he's a mid-carder. I, I, I do not personally see him as a main eventer. That doesn't mean I don't think he should win the title at some point because TNA is a small company, and smaller companies, you can take those kind of chances. You can have someone in the mid-card elevate and, and win the title. You know, um, I mean, we see wrestlers all the time in TNA win the title and then end up in the fucking pre-show two months later. You know, Eric Young, or Rich Swan, dudes like that. So, you know, he's going to win it at some point. But this was this was kind of overbooked. I thought that Frankie Gazarian was going to cash in and um, take himself out of the match as the ref. I thought that's how they were going to get to the because I knew they were going to have to get a new another ref in the ring. Like Frankie wasn't going to count the one, two, three in this match. So um, I did like when he went for the real quick one, two, three, trying to beat. <laughs> trying to make Joe Hendry lose after he, you know, he cost him his opportunity to try to cash in. I'm glad they didn't go the predictable route and actually have him cash in and win. Um, but John Layfield came down and he laid out Joe Hendry. He laid out Frankie Gazarian. And I think now we're going to get this story. Cause the other thing too, is that because John Layfield was involved, I was like, he's clearly on Nick Nemeth's side. So Nick Nemeth is not going to lose the title. Like, there's more to this story. I think a Nick Nemeth heel turn maybe. Nah, I was going to say, I, I thought it may be coming. He wrestled like a heel a little bit in this match. Another person who wrestled like a heel in the match was Jordan Grace. Not a full-on heel, but a, but a little bit of a heel to elevate Masha's babyface push. I, I thought that was masterful. I, I meant to throw that in. But Nick wrestled like a little bit of a heel here as well. So I thought maybe the heel turn was coming. But just the way he was kind of showing outrage after, I'm like, ah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, Joe Hendry lost. And, and people are people are upset about it online. But, uh, you know, I, I'm giving you all sorts of reasons why Joe probably wasn't going to win the match. You know, I and I, I do think he's going to win it at some point. But this was a little overbooked for me. I didn't love it. But, you know, the, the match was was solid enough. And obviously, they weren't going to end the show with this. And, and once they knew they weren't ending the show with this, I was like, Nick Nemeth is winning. It just it just made entirely too much sense. They were going to do this big Masha win and then a big Joe Hendry win, then a big Hendry win. Like, I mean, a Hardy's win. They just weren't. So, um, Nick Nemeth, still your TNA champion. And then we got... The real main event of this show, apparently. The Hardys, who we knew were good. I mean, they decorated the ring. Jeff Hardy decorated the ring. The ring. I mean, obviously, these uh, guys were going to win. But it was full metal mayhem. Tom Hannafin. Oh. The Hardys versus ABC. Chris Bay. Is, I, I don't know why I can't stop saying black. The word black. Ace Austin. <laughs> Is this your card? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's it's not, is it? No. Uh, 
versus the defending TNA Tag Team Champions of the system, Brian Myers and Eddie Edwards. All right, son, I'm going to need those two hams back. I don't have any hams. Lift up your shirt, son. Accompanied by Alicia Edwards. Uh, hi, baby. And um, this match was exactly what we knew it was going to be. It was a car crash, but it worked. And the, I'm sure Jeff Hardy's very dif- disappointed because he had the spot where he tried to slide down the ladder on a chair um, and, and the chair fell off. And I'm sure he's very disappointed because that's not something, oh, I'll, I'll try it again later. You know, you, you have your opportunity and you miss it. And I've said many times, TNA's booking the Hardys very, very well. <laughs> AEW did a horrible job of booking the Hardys. I was still watching the company when the, the majority of their run. They did a horrible job booking them. They looked awful in the ring. And um, the matches they do in TNA are, they know how to book them properly. They know how to use them. They know how to produce the matches. The Hardys aren't going out there trying to hang with the young guys and do shit that they can't do anymore, which was what they were doing in AEW and the reason the matches were so bad. Jeff Hardy looked like an absolute shell of himself in AEW. And even though they're older, they they came to TNA. They've been huge stars. They're openly campaigning to go back to WWE, which everyone is... TNA is not going to be able to sign people unless they admit to their self, admit to themselves that there's no WWE or AEW opportunity. That's the only way they're going to lock people in. So if the Hardys can just get it through their heads that WWE is not going to bring them back and they're too old to be over there, then... Hopefully TNA can kind of lock them down and we can they can finish their career with the company. We knew they were going to win this match. Like there was absolutely n- no I I don't think there was a single person out there that was like, "Oh, well, I think ABC. Do you think as the main event of Bound for Glory, they were going to go off the air with ABC winning or they were going to go off the air with uh the the system? I mean, come on. So we knew the Hardys were going to win this entire time. So everyone's just cheering for the Hardys to pull this off. And I've said many times, Full Metal Mayhem is the one garbage match that I can usually deal with. Because TNA books it pretty decently. It's not like if if it were AEW booking it, it would just be another trash match. But um, it, it, they, do a, they do a pretty good job with it. And they basically made this a TLC match. And they had a couple really good spots. They redid the you know, Edge spearing Jeff Hardy off the top rope years ago while hanging uh, from the belts, whatever mechanism it is that holds the belts. They did that with um, Brian Myers spearing Chris Bay. So that was a nice little a little ode to that. But they sent the people home very, very happy. And I don't know if you caught after the match because the show was over and then the feed kept coming, cutting in and out of them cutting a promo in the ring afterwards. Get, you know, addressing the fans and the way they were speaking sounds like they're going to kind of be around for a bit. There was a, a spot towards the end where Matt Hardy hit the twist of fate on Alicia Edwards, and I thought her titty was going to pop. Come out. on, titty! Come on, titty! But uh, it didn't. I had to use the Astra Elegance sound drop on that one. And um, good bound for glory show. Like I said, folks, th- this was. This was a really, really solid show. I, I could have done without Monsters Ball. I thought the Knockouts Tag Team title match was lacking a little bit, but other than that, you know, they they put on a pretty good show and probably one of their better Bound for Glories in a little bit. Bound for Glory doesn't tend to be one of the better shows. It's just okay every year, <laughs> and it still was probably the third best out of the four pay per views. But again, it's hard for me to say because I was at two of them. But I'm I'm proud of them. I'm proud of with of, of how the show looked. It just this is how a, a TNA pay per view should look. It's how a wrestling pay per view should look. The crowd looked great. They sounded great. It's almost like we're getting visually. We're almost getting back to the glory days a little bit. We're never gonna like really get there. They're not gonna have a million viewers. They're not gonna have eight thousand people in the crowd. But they're but visually, it is getting so much better. And. I'll even take a shot at myself here, but for everyone who is, oh, the company is going to die without Scott Demore. The company is better without Scott Demore. It is clearly better without him around. That is going to do it for me, folks. 
We are pretty much exactly an hour here. I'm your boy, BQ. I'm out. Peace.